Today's A-Level Biology video is on carbohydrates. So we're going to be looking at the various meanings of words such as monosaccharide, disaccharide, polysaccharide, looking at tests for carbohydrates such as the reducing sugars test and tests for starch, and how we're going to draw alpha and beta glucose. So diving in with which elements are found in carbohydrates, that would be carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. Then we're looking at the word monosaccharide, disaccharide and polysaccharide. So saccharide means relating to sugar, and then mono, hopefully you remember from either chemistry or maths, means one. So it's a single simple sugar. Whereas disaccharide, di meaning two, means two simple sugars stuck together. Polysaccharide, poly means many, so it's many simple sugars stuck together. And now I'm just going to touch on some key examples. So for your monosaccharides, you need to know about the presence of trioses containing three carbons. Pentoses, these contain five carbons. The ones you will probably be familiar with are both deoxyribose, which is the sugar found in DNA, and ribose, which is the sugar found in RNA. And then lastly, the hexoses, they are your normal sugars, so glucose, fructose, and galactose. So glucose, maybe you have to learn the formula for that at GCSE, C6H12O6. So it's a hexose because it contains six carbons. Moving on to our disaccharides, those sugars which are made up of two sugars stuck together, your key examples here are sucrose, maltose and lactose. And then your polysaccharides, these are large sugars, they're formed from many smaller subunits sticking themselves together. You're talking about starch, which is the carbohydrate storage compound in plants, glycogen, the carbohydrate storage compound in animals, and then lastly, cellulose, which we know is an important structural component found in the cell walls of plants, and that actually helps support that plant cell. Let's touch on a bit more on chemistry, because we need to know the difference between words such as isomer, molecular formula, and structural formula. Now, you probably met this at GCSE Chemistry, so C4H8. The molecular formula tells you the exact atoms of each element which are present in a compound, so we can see that there are four carbons and eight hydrogens. The structural formulae on the right show how this is laid out, showing all the bonds, and exactly as the name suggests, the structures. Now, you can see that even though both of these structures on the right are C4H8, you can count up and check that they are, they have very different structures because of the positioning of the double bond. And that's where structural formulae are super useful. Because these both have the same molecular formula, but they have different structures, we can say that they are isomers. Right, I now need to show you how to draw alpha and beta glucose. So we're going to start by looking at the molecular formula, which is C6H12O6. Now, do remember here that whatever you draw must at the end have C6H12O6 in it, otherwise you've definitely done something wrong. So always double check your work. I'm going to start by drawing the ring structure for this, which looks something like this. Remember, it's a hexose. It's a six carbon sugar, which is why I'm drawing a hexagon here. And each of these points represents a carbon atom. So there's one, two, three, four, five. And at this point, I like to draw this complicated bit of the molecule up here, which is CH2OH. And there is your sixth carbon. So we're doing well. Now fill in where the rest of those bonds will be. So just draw some nice straight lines here. And then fill up OH over here. And at this point, all you have to do is put an H and an OH on the remaining bonds, making sure that H is at the top and OH is at the bottom, the exception being here where you've just got an extra hydrogen. Do remember when you're drawing these molecules out that hydrogen always forms one bond, oxygen forms two bonds, and carbon forms four bonds. This is something from GCSE chemistry. And if you're, you've obeyed all those rules, then you should really have drawn the right thing. Then it's important that we just double check what we've drawn. So count up all those carbons. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, carbons are happy. Let's change color, count the hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yep, yeah, hydrogens are happy. And then lastly, we'll count the oxygens. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, the oxygens are happy. So now let's look at drawing beta glucose. 
let's use the same method for approaching the beta glucose isomer. So we start by drawing that hexagon, hexagonal ring, six sided with that oxygen in the right hand corner. Draw those bonds on. CH2OH, that's the complicated bit. OHH down here. The crucial thing to notice with the beta glucose isomer is that on the right hand side, the hydrogen and the OH groups swap places. So that is going to be this way round. And then it's a matter of adding hydrogens everywhere else, like I said before. So hydrogens go at the top and then fill in with your OHs. And then finally add that hydrogen at the bottom. And let's go and do our check to make sure we've got everything we need. So we'll count the carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. We'll count the hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Hydrogens are happy. And finally, we'll count those oxygens. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, so we know we've done a good job. We're now going to talk about the test for glucose. So we're trying to prove that glucose is present. You probably learned at GCSE that you add Benedict's solution, you heat it, and if glucose is present, you see a brick red colour appear. But we need to know a bit more about what is actually going on at this point. So Benedict's solution is actually made up of copper 2 sulfate. It's a bright blue colour, it's really beautiful. So what happens is that copper 2 sulfate reacts with the carboxyl group on the glucose, so the COOH, and it causes the Cu2 plus present in the copper sulfate solution to be reduced and it becomes Cu plus. And that's why we call it a reducing sugars test. And when this happens, you produce copper oxide, which is that distinctive brick red color that you see. Now we're trying to form disaccharides from monosaccharides. So you need to know that the two glucose molecules come together, a condensation reaction occurs, and what that means is a small molecule is lost in this reaction, which tends to be water, as is the case here. So a water molecule is lost, causing those two monosaccharides to stick themselves together. And what joins them is called a glycosidic bond. Now, if we do the opposite process, whereby they break apart to form the individual glucose subunits, we're therefore going to call that a hydrolysis reaction. So I'm just going to show you how maltose is formed. Remember, maltose is a disaccharide. It's formed from two alpha glucose monomers joining together by a condensation reaction, which means loss of water. So let's have a look at where this loss of water is going to take place. It's going to take place between the first carbon, so that is the first carbon on this molecule, and the fourth carbon on its neighbouring molecule. So the water molecule must be lost between them. And you know water is H2O, so we lose the water molecule here and it's going to form an oxygen glycosidic bond, and I'll show you that on the next slide. And here you have the disaccharide which forms, so maltose, showing the glycosidic bond joining together those alpha glucose residues. Now we need to look at starch, so that storage compound in plants in greater detail. Starch is a polysaccharide and it's formed from many alpha glucose monomers joining together to form the polysaccharide starch. The two forms of starch you need to know about are amylose and amylopectin. The main difference between them is that amylose is a straight chain, whereas amylopectin is very branched. So what happens when those alpha glucose join together? They join together using glycosidic bonds, which we already know, and they fold up to form a helical structure. Now, do be aware that when those alpha glucose are present in that long chain, they're no, not, no longer known as molecules they're known as residues, and that's just one of those annoying A-level terms you need to be aware of. As we've just mentioned starch, we should probably talk about the test for starch. This is nice and straightforward. Again, a GCSE point, you simply add iodine to the sample, and if it turns blue-black, you know that starch is present. Another polysaccharide we're going to look at in slightly more detail is glycogen. Glycogen is the storage compound of carbohydrate in animals, and it's actually found everywhere in the animal apart from in the brain. There is no glycogen in the brain. And remember that we draw on our glycogen stores when we've exercised because we need to convert it back to glucose to stop us passing out from lack of energy. 
In terms of the structure of glycogen, it's formed from alpha glucose monomers joining together with glycosidic bonds. Its structure is very, very similar to amylopectin, but if anything, it's even more branched. Lastly, cellulose, so that third polysaccharide, the one that's found in cell walls. This is actually formed from many beta glucose molecules joining together. So remember starch and glycogen were both formed from alpha glucose? No, this time cellulose is formed from beta glucose joining together with glycosidic bonds. The advantage of this is it forms very straight chains and that's actually very good as a structural component because it gives a lot more strength to the particular cell in which it's found. Hope you found this helpful guys. I'll try and be back soon with another video. Leave me any comments below. I always like reading them.